This is episode 194 of The Stem Cell Podcast, Evolution of Stemness Control and Multicellularity with Dr. Emma Hammerlund. Hey, everybody. We are Dr. Daylon James and Dr. Arun Sharma. Welcome back to The Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Emma Hammerland from Lund University. She's on the podcast to talk about her research on the evolutionary roots of animal health and disease. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news that's coming up. But first, we'd like to remind our listeners about ESC and IPSC News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by Stem Cell Science News. ESC and IPSC News summarizes all the latest research, news, jobs, and events in ESC and IPSC research and delivers it right to your inbox every Wednesday. So save time and keep current with ESC and IPSC News. Subscribe for free at www.eslnews.com. I'm going to start things off on a bit of a tangent here. There has been a piece of news coming out from the ICCR that I thought we should probably discuss briefly before we jump into the, the paper roundup. Now, we're all familiar with the 14-day rule. This is something that we've discussed quite a bit here on the show, this rule that is basically a recommendation from the International Society for Stem Cell Research that's... Um, indicated that perhaps we shouldn't grow human embryos ex vivo beyond two weeks. Okay, this has been a, a rule that's been around for, for decades. And it's not just the ISSCR that's been focused on this particular rule, but other countries and governments around the world have really adopted this rule and turned it into a law in some circumstances. And this is dictating how long you can actually study human embryos in a dish for um, – for different places around the world. So, so the ICCR, ICCR has been hinting at this for some time now, that they were going to revisit this 14-day rule. And the question is, why now? And if you're listening to the show, you've probably heard us talk about all of these amazing new technologies that have come out over the last even year now, looking at ways to extend human development and really study human development in a dish that hasn't really been possible before. So we've talked recently about the, say, blastoids that are being studied by Jun Wu and the Belmonte group also has some uh, work focusing on this too. We talked about Dr. Jacob Hanna's work using the roller culture to study embryo development longer than what's been possible. So there have been a lot of new technologies that have emerged and this is Sort of, you know, this is telling the ICCR was jumping on some of these technologies and they were saying, you know what, maybe we should reconsider this 14 day guideline. And so that's what they did. They came out with a, a new set of guidelines recently saying that the 14 day rule should be reconsidered, should be relaxed, and it should be considered on a case by case basis. There were some other things that actually came out in these guidelines as well. For example, um, the you know they're advising against editing human embryos genes and human embryos until the safety of gene editing and crispr is better established in vivo but i think the real focus is this relaxation of the 14 day rule it's again it's not a it's not a regulatory body this uh, the iccr they're recommending guidelines but for a, a lot of instances what they say goes so this is a this is a big piece of news yes uh I've been waiting for this. I think we've talked about it. And, you know, with all the work that's been accumulating and and, and the progress, I, I'd say, that we've made collectively, it's time to unshackle the researchers and the work. I, I, though, I will say, though, I'm a little bit, I wouldn't say concerned, but I'm I, minor anxiety, trepidation about the studies that are going to come out and how they may be a lightning rod for controversy and, um, you know, just any, any other type of oppo opposing voice voices that would try and then, um, restore the shackles and maybe have like a kind of 
overcompensation and the regulatory bodies just because, you know, we've got to this point now between Jacob Hanna, who said in the news that he's been able to get the roller culture going from zygotic stage, essentially, from the o oviduct. He gets a fertilized mm -hmm. zygote, fertilized egg zygote, and gets it through the roller culture to organogenesis stages. So, like, you know, when you hear about that, and then you hear about the blastoids, it's hard not to imagine the idea of in the entirety of, you know, gestation, take our early stages, at least to the critical stages where you get primary germ layers and their derivatives. It's hard not to picture that happening ex vivo and uh, guaranteed uh, to, to stimulate some controversy. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But generally, I would say this is a great, great piece of news. And I can't wait to see, I mean, in the years to come, the 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 type of science that's going to follow from this declaration. Absolutely. And you can be sure that this is going to be revisited in the months to come. You know, we have the ICCR annual meeting coming up not too long from now, and I'm sure this is going to be a, a point of emphasis at the meeting, not only these guidelines, but also the technology that's kind of spurring the reconstruction of some of these guidelines. So moving on into the actual papers in the roundup from today, the first thing I'm going to talk about are uh, cardioids. These are cardiac, quote unquote, organoids. And the title of this paper is Cardioids Reveal Self-Organizing Principles of Human Cardiogenesis. It's a cell paper. First author is Pablo Hofbauer. Last author is Sasha Menjin. And this is coming from the Austrian Academy of Sciences, or IMBA, the uh, Institute of Molecular Biotechnology. So, I'm a card-carrying developmental cardiac biologist. We all know this by now. You are too, Dale. You know, we'll give that to you. But, you know, and, and I've, some, I've talked about this quite a bit on the show. We've had organoids of all different types. IPS-derived organoids, primary organoids of all different tissues. Now, when it comes to cardiac developmental organoids, they've been a bit lacking, for a lot of different tissues, you can recapitulate development in a dish by generating organoids from IPSCs for, say, the liver, the, the gut, all these different tissue types. Cardiac development has been a little bit different. You know, Part of it has to do with how the heart actually forms. You have this looping morphology, this looping uh, mechanism that happens, generation of the first heart field, the second heart field different cell types coming together to actually create this pump that we all know and love, right? And here they're actually trying to recapitulate some of those mechanisms to create quote unquote cardiac developmental organoids in a dish. We've talked another about another version of this previously on the show that actually incorporated some endoderm as well in these developmental organoids. But the the really striking thing about this particular study, and I think part of the reason why it got a lot of press is some of the videos, some of the images here where it's almost like you're looking at a ventricle, like a contracting ventricle in a dish. So it's got a cool factor. I, I won't deny that. So these are self-organizing. That's the other thing, self-organizing cardiac organoids or cardioids from human PSCs that are uh, specifying, patterning, morphing into these chamber-like structures. They actually say it's sort of like a left ventricle, if you know your cardiac biology. So they have a cavity. Their complexity can be controlled by the signaling that's important for cardiac development in vivo. So that's you know looking at the Wnt BMP signaling axis that I actually modulate by uh, every day to differentiate iPSCs into cardiomyocytes in the first place. It's the same signaling axes that you're modulating here to make these cardioids. It's really neat to looking at some of their videos. You can see these things really just explode in, in size over the course of just a few days and just create these pseudo chamber like structures. And the other thing is uh, hand one, which is a transcription factor that's really critical to uh, heart development and also has been implicated in heart chamber defects. Uh, that's really important for basically controlling the, the specification of these cardioids. The other really cool thing that they did at the end was an injury model. They subjected these cardioids to a cold shock, basically killed a portion of the cells on the exterior of the cardioid using a cold steel rod. And to kind of mimic what happens during a myocardial infarction, uh, they actually saw some fibroblasts that were migrating to the site of the injury, depositing some extracellular matrix. So it's kind of an injury model as well. And the other nifty thing is that it's uh, this chamber 
has multiple layers composed of the different layers of cells that you would actually find in the real left ventricle of the heart. So on the inside, you have your endoderm, then you have your myocardium, the contracting myocytes, and the outside, you have, you have your epicardium too. Um, again, it's it's not perfect because it's not perfectly recapitulating all the, the first heart field, second heart field, looping morphology, all that crazy nifty morphogenesis that happens during cardiac development in vivo. But it's a, I think it's it's one step closer towards developing that ultimate cardiac developmental organoid. And I think one thing that they said that they want to do next is if these are kind of like left ventricular organoids, then they want to make the right ventricle and then the atrial organoids. And then we're going to take the uh, we're going to take the approach of Sergio Pasca, right, and do the assembloid work and combine all these together. And eventually you're going to have this pseudo heart that has four chambers and then it's game over, right? <laughs> Isn't that the end game? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't transplant that art, but you can be my guest. Put in a mouse maybe first. I uh, I agree. This is a, a really great um, paper about m moving toward... Uh, a more perfect model. Um, and the pictures really are out of sight and the movies and the, the reproducibility of this. I think what it, it's doing, it's like, you know, flattening the field a little bit to make uh, these organoids accessible. Um, and I think they emphasize that point with the cryo injury. You know, there's a lot of people that are interested in the modeling infarct, but they're, they're using the mouse because they just don't have the wherewithal to make the tissues of a human heart and, and, and examine these things. So this is, I think, as you said, it's, it's creating a model that's really robust, reproducible and accessible to all cardiac researchers. Um, and yeah, the pictures are nuts and it looks like a heart, all the chambers, it almost looked like mm -hmm. trabeculated to me, although I know it wasn't trabeculum and, and, and the components, you know, uh, you say a card carrying cardiac, I am too, but I would add to that. Card carrying <laughs> cardiovascular, my friend. I, I love the go. vascular element, and they had endocardium in there, so I, I was very pleased to see that. But I will, I will though return to your point. It's not really a criticism; it's more of a question. Um, I don't know about philosophical, but in some ways practical. Like you said, it this this isn't a heart. The heart is made with like there's a whole biomechanical apparatus, the looping. There's mm -hmm. there's things that happen that in here it's like a spontaneous pseudo heart, as you said. Um, yeah. So ultimately, you know, when you talk about therapy as well as modeling, like is a, a pseudo heart enough uh, to to get the job done? Um, it, it, can you like engineer uh, the biology and obviate the the kind of canonical growth process? This is this is a question I think that everybody's asking. Yeah, I agree with you, but you know. To build on that point, they did some disease modeling here with hypoplastic left heart, and they're able to show that even in this like very simple model of the cardiac ventricle, you can disrupt the gene pathways that are implicated in hypoplastic left heart, and you can recapitulate some of those defects even in this uh, chamber in a dish. So it's not perfect, definitely not perfect, but part of the reason that we all love these kind of cardiac studies is because of the imaging, right? You know, you have such beautiful videos of these cells, you know, these cells contracting, these chambers contracting. Videos say a million words, don't they? Yes, they do. And you really set me up, Arun. Thank you for that. Because <laughs> my welcome. story is about exactly that question. And, and it's to your point, you know, it's this isn't about making a heart necessarily. It's about understanding fundamental molecular processes. And that's like how you treat things, right? You know, everyone likes to talk in our field about making tissues and organs, but the, what works nowadays is drugs, um, biologics, right? So understanding the molecular pathways at that level, you know, at the microscopic level, um, it's critical to unraveling uh, these diseases. And imaging is critical to that. Um, you know, cells, in organs, it's kind of like a whole community. It's all world. Um, at a microscopic scale, there's all these interactions and communication between the cells, which are the players in the tissues that really make life happen uh, at the large scale. And we'll probably talk about that with our guest. Um, but there's a lot of signals, right? And there's a lot of cell types uh, in that native environment. And it's dynamic, right? The biological processes are, are 
action, right? This isn't, there's nothing static about it, but we kind of look at static pictures and try and infer um, because it's hard to reconstitute uh, what goes on. To, to make life happen or make these physiological processes, recapitulate them in vitro or even ex vivo, taking the thing out of an animal and have it continue ex vivo, that's tough because it's hard to look at it. You know, at the microscopic scale, using the tools we have to see proteins with fluorescence in, in particular, um, to see biological processes with light and fluorescence, it's tough at, the, at that microscopic uh, scale, also at the time scale, you know, we need to look at these things live. So it's hard. There's like motion blur in a live animal. You got heartbeat, right? You got respiration. You get motion blur. Also, um, there's all kinds of different refractive indexes when indices, when you're looking at tissue, you know, you've seen it. You look at a fat cell versus a, another type of cell, they're going to have a different refractive index. So you have all these aberrations optically when you're looking at, at tissue, depending on the cell type, and you'll have different levels of signal to noise ratio, right? Um, and then there's the light. The light itself can be a problem. The light can interfere with cellular processes. It can kill the cells. Um, so you have like a very limited budget. You have a budget of photons that you can deliver to this cell, and you have to be able to capture what you want to see at what scale and at what time interval. It's really tough to get all those things happening. There's been a lot of technologies that have been developed. Spinning disk, there's adaptive optics, there's uh, two photon, there's light sheet. All of these advances have kind of tried to coalesce multiple uh, elements into one um, and to optimize, but there's always a trade-off between resolution, speed, signal to noise ratio, and the health of the sample, all right? This is known, even though that's four things, I didn't know this, this is kind of nifty, it's four things, but it's known as the pyramid of frustration. That's what mm. the microscopists have named it. <laughs> it's a nice name, I like it. Um, but uh, frustration no more, right? Because thanks to the efforts of Jing Tao Fan, Li Yu, and Kyung Gai Dai at Tsinghua University in Beijing. That was a mouthful, but I think I pulled it off. They came up with this thing that combines a lot of elements, all right? It combines the, um, the AO element, which is the adaptive optics, right? In this long acronym, it's kind of ridiculous, called Digital Adaptive Optics Scanning Light Field Mutual Iterative Tomography. And they call that Dow's Limit, all right? And it's all kinds of physics and optics and stuff that I really do not understand. You just got to look at this paper, though, if you're into that. And if you're not into that, look at the paper for the movies because they're nuts. They looked at a bunch of things to demonstrate the power of their technique. And it was always side by side looking at this versus like light sheet or, or light field or whatever they had as a comparison. And they got this effectively using the Dow's Limit. They got high speed, high resolution in 3D. They got like volumetric um, and they use this wave front correction element that I don't understand. You should look at it. Um, and all this to uh, engender really high signal to noise with very low phototoxicity. And it's like a relatively compact system. The thing doesn't fill a room, right? And using this, they could get volumetric imaging across 225 by 225. Um, that's length width and depth 16 microns. All right. So that doesn't sound huge. It's like you're looking at a grain, like a little grain of salt, but that's big in the biological field, and it's the scale, the time scale that they were able to do this, millisecond time scale, and over a long, long time, you know, hundreds of thousands of time points added up to three hours, right? But like three hours with hundreds of thousand time points, so you could see essentially a live movie. And they did a lot of crazy live stuff, looking at cell migration in zebrafish, they looked in the mouse, they looked at um, like the subcellular dynamics, neutrophil migration, they looked at tumor cell circulation, all kind of, uh, you know, presaging all the, the kind of work that could be done with this. Um, so really exciting. And the reason why it's on the stem cell podcast is that they had literally one figure that was about <laughs> uh, neural organoids, where they looked at mm -hmm. like, at the conduction of the nerve signal, which was actually really, really cool to see. So, so that's what qualifies it for the stem cell podcast. But really what this is about is crazy imaging, a, 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 an advance that I think is going to uh, change the way we see, literally, uh, these biological processes and combined with organoids and the kind of ex vivo technology that we're, we're able to do nowadays. I can't, it's going to be a feast for the eyes, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
I love it. Part of the reason I love it is because they validated this system in so many different different experimental models. So we got zebrafish, Drosophila, mice, pigs, cell culture, slice preparation, and like you said, the reason why this is on the show, 3D cerebral organoids. So that's fantastic. The fact that this is applicable to all these different tissue types says that it's it's a universal system. I'm not going to comment on the Douse Limit acronym. I don't know. <laughs> not the biggest fan. But hey, you know, it's not my study, right? I will say this sort of comes back. Uh, one issue, and we discussed this before the show, if you're getting this kind of resolution with this sort of imaging and you're getting these really long-term time-lapse movies of you know very high resolution uh, frames the problem on the other side is going to be the processing okay inevitably that is the issue um yeah you're benefiting from this incredible resolution but perhaps not everybody has that kind of processing power yeah that's for sure and uh you know across science sciences where we're struggling with this you know, with the single cell seq data and all the bioinformatics. And yeah, I hadn't considered the all the volumes of, of imaging data also that are accumulating. Um, and this is precious stuff, you know, can, it could be mined for little micro interactions. If you look at some of the videos in the paper, they identified these unique processes that I wouldn't have been seen at a lower resolution. And that really requires amazing processing power and archival resources. So yes, I, I, we're going to have to lean on our uh, computer scientists and bioinformaticians to kind of sort that out for us, Arun, not my problem. I mean, it kind of is your problem. You're <laughs> the one doing single cell these days anyways. So you have to do a little bit of bioinformatics on your end. And our problem, Arun. Our, our problem. problem. Our problem. Collective problem of the field. Speaking of single cell, the next paper we're going to talk about is titled Charting Human Development Using a Multi-Endodermal Organ Atlas and Organoid Models. This is another atlas paper. The focus of this is on the endoderm. So, of course, you know, we're looking at the diversity during human development. And there is a ton of diversity, okay? And single cell has been so instrumental in helping us to figure out all the different types and subtypes of cells and tissues that are found within the human body. There is There are multiple international consortia that are focused on just seeking the stuff out of all different types of tissues and finding what sort of cells are found at different time points during development. And that's sort of what they're doing here. They're looking at cell states and transcription factors and organ-specific epithelial stem cell and mesenchyme interactions across different endodermal lineages, specifically the respiratory and the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. Now, it's not just a single cell paper. It's not just a an atlas paper. The, the And part of the reason this is on the, the stem cell podcast Cast, is the the other element this is also implementing the atlas as a as a tool to compare and benchmark human pluripotent stem cell derived intestinal organoids hios which we've talked about a few times on the show so they want to benchmark these hios to the real deal and say how close are they to real intestinal tissue that's found during development. And they're showing that indeed, even these rudimentary like pseudo tissues that we call organoids, they're still recapitulating the different cell states that you would find during development. And they're actually using these HIOs to reproduce the molecular dynamics of how the intestinal epithelium and the mesenchyme are actually emerging. So for example, they look at the gene NRG1, and they show that it can enhance intestinal stem cell maturation in vitro. And another gene, a homeobox transcription factor, CDX2, is needed for the regionalization of the intestinal epithelium and the mesenchyme. Okay, So you're going back and forth between this atlas data and the organoid data to show and confirm that your organoids are legit. These intestinal organoids are legit. And if they generate an atlas. If you're generating an atlas, you have to have an online resource so that everybody around the world can play with your data. And indeed, that's what they have. So they generated a nice little website that you can log on and snoop around because I know you're a big fan of single cell, aren't you, Dale? I love my single cell. 
Um, and I love that this whole era of the data sharing for single cell, it is actually pretty great because it's like you can do all these experiments without ever picking up a pipette. Or what you can do is you do your own experiments and then you have all this complementary data. I can't tell you how often, you know, right now I'm, I'm looking in the ovary at endothelial cells, for example, and they just, because they popped up and I, I'm like, oh, okay. There's the endothelial cells that are in the ovary. Let me pull every endothelial cell off the internet, off geo, and see what are the differences for my endothelial cells. And it's right there. It's novel information that you didn't know was right in front of you. So I have to say, these, these resources, while they may seem very vanilla, are, are foundational and critical to uh, you know future studies and also offer fodder for, for any researcher looking at how the HIO data set might compare to their own. Um, so yeah, uh, hats off to this group. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, I think they had something like 10 uh, aborted fetuses or something mm -hmm. and, and comparing that all. The one thing I think is funny is that they have all this primary material from all the aborted fetuses and all the organoids are made from a single stem cell line, H9, which is not to mm -hmm. take away from the work because H9 is like the stem cell line, but it's just a testament to how how much science has been built on this one stem cell line. It's really amazing. If they could give a prize to a cell line, this is the cell line that you get. It is the workhorse line in our field. And I definitely do want to acknowledge the, the group doing the work here. This is uh, Jay Gray Camp from uh, Basel, Switzerland. Also, first author is Chun He Yu. And yeah, you're absolutely right. That is the workhorse of our field, and it has been for a long, long time. I do want to talk about one other thing, though. You, you brought up the – we discussed uh, limitations with data, even in the previous paper. I think this is – perhaps going to change the way we do training in biomedical research. Because at this point, thanks to papers such as this, there is just an unbelievable amount of sequencing data that's out there. You have all of these different atlases. Now you can, in my opinion, never even touch the wet lab. Right. Even if you're a, like a PhD student, if you're just doing bioinformatics, you can probably do your entire PhD on just mining, just mining these data sets. It's a, it's a different world, right? Yeah. Well, they are in demand bioinformaticians. If you're looking for a field to specialize, I would incorporate that into your skill set for sure. Um, just one more thing I, I want to say, circling all the way back to the beginning of the show and the relaxation of the the 14 day limit, I, I will say another big element of this work and it's critical to acknowledge is that it couldn't be done uh, if there were uh, in the US, there's been certain debate recently about whether we would have access to fetal research. Now this, this research wasn't specifically done in the US, but just to underscore how critical uh, fetal material is to progress in the field. And it's a segue to my next story in part because fetal material has also been used therapeutically, you know, in treatment of par Parkinson's disease. It was one of the early contenders. Um, so we really count on it. And I'm going to tell you a story about a related neurodegenerative disease that has nothing to do with fetal uh, material, but I just wanted to put that out there. We're really, uh, you know, getting into the policy this episode. If you don't like that, send us an email. Um, getting to the next story, this is a story, as I said, about Alzheimer's disease. Um, and specifically, it's about a, a kind of a, a fact that didn't exist when I was a kid. The idea that there was neurogenesis in the adult brain. When I was a kid, it was thought, just like in the heart, that there, that was all the proliferation that was ever going to be done was done uh, once you were born or once you were through, you know, I don't know, once you were an adult. They were wrong. Doesn't matter what they thought. The reality is, is that there is ongoing neurogenesis in the adult human brain. And also it's known that in Alzheimer's disease patients, um, that neurogenesis is uh, impaired. And it's thought that this could contribute to the memory decline. Um, and specifically, the neurons we're talking about are born in the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus. Okay. And these neurons have been implicated in a lot of things, including memory, pattern separation, emotional control, cognitive flexibility, amongst other things. Specifically, pattern separation is an important one for AD, right? Because it's, it's a memory function 
that enables the separation of similar representations into distinct non-overlapping memories. It's essentially how you order events. And this is what gets disrupted in some AD patients. Therefore, everything kind of falls together, collapses on itself. One big memory um, or lost memories. Um, and this uh, process, pattern separation, has been long linked um, to the adult hippocampal, hippocampus and specifically neurogenesis in the adult hippocampus. Um, so there's impaired performance and pattern separation tasks, uh, just mildly impaired with, with patients who have mild cognitive impairment. And then that progresses with late stage AD patients. It's like gangbusters, right? Uh, and interestingly, there's more neuroblasts in the dentate gyrus of, uh, patient antemortem. So if you look right after they die in patients who have mild cognitive impairment, they have more neuroblasts in patients who have full-blown AD. So for all these reasons, there's this idea and link of neurogenesis in the adult hippocampus that may be linked, um, and dentate gyrus specifically to, to uh, the progression of Alzheimer's disease and maybe potentially therapy. You could target that, right? But the problem is that we don't really understand uh, the molecular mechanisms that are involved in adult hippocampal neurogenesis, right? Um, that said, previously, uh, Evgenia Salta from the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, um, she previously had shown that there's this MIR, MIR 132, that regulates the timing of cell cycle exit um, and, you know, proliferation in neural stem cells in the spinal cord, okay? So kind of far afield, but because it had something to do, and also because uh, MIR has also been implicated, MIR-132 has also been implicated in uh, the progression of Alzheimer's disease, or it's like low in Alzheimer's disease patients. This was all a strong rationale for looking at the, uh, the role of this microRNA in patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And what uh, Dr. Salta's group found was that, yes, indeed, the MIR-132 uh, consistently downregulated in Alzheimer's disease patients and material. And what they showed that it, when you um, overexpress it, it's, uh, or, or in mouse models, they showed that it's, uh, it has a cell autonomous proneurogenic effect. Um, and using a couple of different uh, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, as well as uh, cultured human primary material, neural stem cells that they got from patients, they showed that uh, adult hippocampal neurogenesis is directly affected. So it goes wrong um, when AD comes into play. And if you replace MIR-132 in these mouse models, not in the humans, obviously, uh, you can restore the neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And uh, you can uh, mitigate the memory deficits. So it's a nice, on the one hand, it, 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 it shows that uh, neurogenesis in the hippocampus is relevant. It shows that MIR-132 is relevant. And potentially, it, has, it offers the idea of targeting uh, MIR-132 therapeutically to try and mitigate the uh, neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease patients. So, uh, 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 you know, a pretty big study, cell stem cell, uh, not for no reason, uh, a lot of implications for this. We'll have to see what comes down the pipe in terms of like delivery. How do you, how do you target this or, or, or mitigate um, the loss of neurogenesis in Alzheimer's disease patients by, you know, looking into this pathway? We'll see. Yeah, it's a fantastic piece of work. Uh, I do want to bring back to the limitations really quick, since technically I am in an Alzheimer's research lab and Clive Svensson's lab. So I absorb some of this information through osmosis. So I hope hopefully he's not listening to the show right now. Sorry, Clive. But limitations of the study, the mouse model that they're actually using here is a familial mouse model, a model of familial Alzheimer's. And it makes sense. You're looking at specific mutations, right? But there's a whole other subset of Alzheimer's in the, the sporadic cases, right? I, I don't know how applicable or uh, translatable some of this work would be to, to that subset of Alzheimer's. But you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a part of it is understanding the changes that are happening in neurodevelopment and also the changes that are happening in this field. Like you talked about, when you were a kid, you had no idea that the brain was continuing to grow and neurogenesis kept on happening. So take care of your brains, folks. It's They are still dividing. They are still growing, even if you're an adult. 
Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's true. These, it's hard, obviously, a mouse model, it has to be genetic, right? So they, they, they didn't really have an alternative. I wonder if the patients where they see the MIR-132 correlation with disease progression, if that's in the familial or the sporadic, because, you know, it, it's sometimes in science, you cobble, you connect the dots, right? And because you're fundamentally limited when you're working in the brain in humans, um, in a disease that has, you know, late onset. I mean, that's, that's, that's a pyramid of frustration for you. I'll tell you that much, but, um, you do what you can. And, uh, these guys have, have done, I think a great job, a little bit outside their expertise, Afghania, you're moving in the brain. You're welcome. I can't wait to see what you do next. Moving on to, uh, the interview with Dr. Emma Harmelin. Before we get into that though, I have a quick message from stem cell technologies Take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with mTeaser Plus from Stem Cell Tech, the most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and iPS cell maintenance is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. mTeaser Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. You can go out and party. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaserplus. And now, without further ado, let's talk about stem cells and evolution. Wow, can't wait. All right, you guys, on this episode, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Emma Hammerland, who is Associate Professor in the Division of Translational Cancer Research at Lund University. Emma is a geobiologist and is particularly curious why life got big on Earth. She uses tumors as a model for animal evolution. Her lab aims to unravel key components behind the rise of both multicellular life forms, such as animals and plants, and tumor multicellularity within animals um, in order to advance our understanding of animal origins and develop approaches to disrupt tumor growth. And here's the thing, her lab uses both geobiology and tumor biology to explore the evolutionary roots of animal health and disease. Um, and that's why she's such an exciting guest to have on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hammerland. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a privilege. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun, Dr. Hammerland. Your lab has a very unique focus at the intersection of evolutionary biology and cancer biology. And in particular, you focused on how we can use cancer tumors as a model system to actually study how multicellular animals have evolved. It's not a connection that I've actually made before in my own mind, but now that I think about it, what is a tumor if not a unicellular organism trying to become multicellular as quickly as possible, right? It's evolution on an accelerated time scale. I, that's one way to think about it. So tell us a little bit more about actually using cancer tumors as a model to study evolution, and in particular, how you made that connection and decided to study it in the first place. Well, that's a good question, and the answer might be a, a bit long, but I think, as you say, we don't make the connection, but when you think about it, they definitely uh, they uh, cancer cells do that transition back and forth between multi. They leave the multicellular sort of organization and they go into a more dyskaryotic state, and then can actually form multicellularity again. And of course, it's not a beautiful kind of multicellularity. It's not an organism. It might not even be a proper multicellularity, more like a herd behavior. But they do it all the time, as you say. They're hugely successful. As and I would dare to say it's one of the most successful transitions to multicellularity that earth has ever seen because mm. on the sort of on the nice version of multicellularity it's actually just plants and animals and fungi that ever made it and mm. earth is four and a half billion years old so it's not that apparently not that easy to make the transition from one cell to to multicellularity and tumors do it all the time and i of course been trapped in the oxygen paradigm thinking that high oxygen is a trigger for animal life on earth but you never heard about a tumor only you know appearing in really oxygenated tissues mm. it's sort of the opposite there so so when i realized that we can listen to tissue and specifically study this sort of transition in, in real time Thanks to cancer cells and, and tumors, I, I I thought we had a, like a we have a well of information that we can sort of dig from that w how that transition actually happens, what 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 cap cellular capacities are involved. So I think. 
to begin with it was I was thinking I could gain from tumor biology, but now I actually think that tumor biology can also gain from from uh, from knowing a bit more of what's happened in the past, what's normal, you know, in evolutionary sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, from, uh, you know, when I hear tumor being trained as a stem cell biologist, one of the early lessons in pluripotent stem cell biology, at least, is is that you get teratomas, right? You get these yeah. disorganized growths of all the different tissues. And that's quite different from like a malignant tumor, a cancer cell. While tumors arise, cancers arise from genetic transformation most of the time, much of the time. Teratomas are like karyotypically normal, right? But they're just this, mm. this uh, cell of... Uh, great potential in an aberrant niche, and therefore they undergo this, this disordered differentiation. So I can see how competition between cancer cell clones is kind of like a in miniature, a, a nice model of evolution. Um, you know, turning it to like teratoma as a different kind of uh, tumor model. Uh, mm. Is there anything to be learned from that? angle, you know, the di emergence of different tissue types and competition mm. between tissue types uh, towards like an ordered structure of an animal that walks around versus this disordered teratoma. I mean, just thinking, is there mm. is there anything, any way that you think you could apply that specific facet of pluripotent cells to your work? Uh, for sure. I think that's a good idea. And that's all. So that that's neighboring using organoids, I guess, you know, mm. if you actually have organoids that are that are non-transformed also, you can study how they interact with each other. And, and in, for my question, I'm, of course, interested in how stemness can be achieved when there is oxygen around. And mm -hmm. that would be a perfect thing to study in organoids or even teratomas. What, what stem cell pools are actually there in this sort of physiologically oxic mm -hmm. conditions? And how do they maintain their stemness, although there is oxygen around there so 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 yes i think that would be that would be one system to to study the normal tissue maintenance in a sense even though in the back of your head always knowing it's not normal mm -hmm. but it's a it's normal compared to to transform tissue of course mm -hmm. Right. And oxygen is really critical for stem cell function. And it's no secret that a variety of stem cells enjoy hypoxia since these low oxygen conditions actually help maintain the stem cell function. And a lot of folks actually grow induced pluripotent stem cells in hypoxic incubators or resort to using hypoxia while making iPSCs during the reprogramming process. And yeah. of course, a really important set of proteins that actually regulates all of this, the hypoxic response, oxygen cell sensing in stem cells and differentiated cells is the HIF family, the hypoxia-inducible yeah. transcription factors. Would you say that evolutionarily speaking, the HIF proteins and these oxygen sensing proteins perhaps, you know, perhaps played the maybe the most important protein role in helping life on Earth become more complex and multicellular? And how do you actually study the evolution of these kind of proteins in the first place? Oh, that's a very good question. And of course, I would claim for the moment that HIF might have been one of the most important uh, sort of innovations that allowed uh, animal diversity to really kick off. But it also has to do what we have studied yet, of course, and it's thanks to the cancer field that we've studied HIF so intensely, right? It's less studied in uh, developmental biology and not at all studied in the sort of Earth history field yet. Yeah. So the limelight has been on the HIF family for different reasons, but I'm sure there must be other innovations like the HIF family that we're going to talk about in 20 years or 20 or 30 years that might be as important to inducing stem cell properties at, at oxic conditions like HIF2 is known to do now, for example. And what we've done is follow back it's sort of into the phylogenetic trees of animal to see if that makes sense, if HIF is animal specific. And it turns out to be at least HIF, HIF1 alpha is, is basically animal specific. The really primitive ones like sponges and tenovores doesn't have HIF1, but those were not 
those were not the ones that really diversified in the Cambrian explosion. Those are the animals that we call bilateral animals. So, so insects or, and, you know, mollus, mollusks and crustaceans and all those ones really diversify. All of those have HIF1. And you can argue that HIF, HIF1 alpha was critical for them to be able to switch on and off metabolism, for example. We also know from nematodes that HIF1 alpha is extremely important to tolerate sulfide. And sulfide is present in all of the sediments where animals live today and where the Cambrian explosion really kicked off. Mm. So I think there, there there could be many lines of evidence to suggest that HIF-1 alpha was extremely important to be able to live in conditions where chem- chemistry fluctuates. Mm. And it really does fluctuate all the time if you want to live close to the shelf or you know the surface of the ocean where there's always some carbon raining down, which is going to create anoxia. You have sulfide coming up. You have you're sort of if you want to sort of if you want to live where the food is on Earth, you want to live in conditions where also chemistry is changing all the time. Mm. And that's probably not that easy for a primitive multicellular organism, unless you have something like HIF alpha, HIF one alpha that can switch your you know that can set that can register and respond to fluctuations. But it's interesting to see also that HIF two alpha, which we think is one of these sort of excellent tools to to uh, maintain stemness at more oxic conditions or let's say less hypoxic conditions um that one is vertebrate specific and it actually comes into the sort of vertebrate evolution before epo which makes perfect sense that you first need to have have control of your stemness at oxic conditions and first thereafter you can flush your system and your tissues with loads of oxygen so you can actually see that. So that makes sense that HIF2 was in place first, and then you have really efficient sort of oxygen, oxygen carrying blood system. Yeah, I mean, what's amazing for me is I, I, we get it, you know, evolution in stem cells, right? Because we we have to understand it to, before we get to our expertise. But I really have not thought about the eons. I mean, we're talking about eons, not just like evolution. We're talking about global atmospheric change, right? The, the changes yeah. that, that were going on that these animals were reacting to were fundamental and global. And, and it's not just the, the proteins, right? The HIF-1, HIF-2, but also the systems, right? The cardiovascular system is critical adaptation to living in a, in a world breathing air, right? Um, and that's well, part of your major interest. How do animals get big? How do you scale? You got to distribute yeah. uh, all the gases. You got to clear all the toxic metabolites. That's a prerequisite, right? So with, with so much focus um, now in, in stem cells uh, on organoids, you alluded to it. We're, we're looking at organoids and their ability to replicate all the complexity of tissues. But there's also this appreciation that they're not vascularized, right? They, they're not really yeah. akin to to their correlates out there in, in nature. Uh, you know, maybe we're not paying enough attention to the potential for organoids to answer basic questions about scale. You know, you yeah. talk, you kind of alluded to it. Like we talk about organoids like, oh, it can make like uh, approximate a heart, approximate lungs. But what about just big, getting big? How animals yeah. got big on earth? Have you, have you thought about, seems like you might have uh, thought about using organoids or, or a, t- a similar type of, of, model to to that end just scaling for sure i've thought about we we hope to use organoids more we have a i'm recruiting a postdoc now who's going to look at sort of stem nests at physoxic conditions so so actually doing what everyone else is doing but focusing on when stemness is maintained at higher oxygen concentrations you know up to five seven ten and that because that's what i think is the real paradox to us, it doesn't seem like an issue because we make it so, I mean, we, we live for a hundred years. We have these adult stem cell pools that just regenerate our tissues all the time. All we have to do is is sleep and eat and we can get bigger and mm. older. Mm. But from an evolutionary perspective, I think it's remarkable. No other animal, no other organism than vertebrates get this big and live this long in oxic conditions than we do. And insects, for example, are described as a very sort of successful animal group. They, I mean, they make so many percent of all animal animal diversity. But if you think about it, they're, the majority of their life, they're actually larvae. And those larvae are living in hypoxic conditions. Mm. They can live for, you know, eight years or like this, uh, 
circ- circadas, circadas yeah. in the eastern U.S. Now they live for 17 yeah. years in the soil, like half a meter down, mm. and then they go up and breed for a day or two. <laughs> so we think of the adult insect as a the insect, but the major life as an insect is actually like a larvae somewhere where it's hypoxic. So I think that organoids are interesting partly because they are not vascularized, and and that is described as a problem, but actually. Uh, for the evolution of multicellularity, that was the case. The big, as you say, the the first organisms were not vascularized in the sense we think of, uh, you know, red blood cells today. So how could that? How could that? How, how does that actually work? So it means that it actually must be lower in oxygen inside. And and I'd like to follow that. I have these beautiful micro electrodes, which are you know five micrometers at the tip that we can sort of in insert in any kind of tissue or setting and actually measure what oxygen is like. Mm. And I'd like to know that. But I would, as I said, I'd like to focus on where we have stem cells or where it's also slightly oxygenated. Mm. I think that's a, I think it's a fascinating paradox that hasn't been appreciated yet. We think of you know, cells coping with hypoxia is remarkable, but I think mm-hmm. it's remarkable that cells can cope with, at least stem cells can cope with, with higher oxygen. You know, even vascular plants have their stem cells in a hypoxic niche. Right. We have some of our hematopoietic stem cells in the hypoxic niche. But what about the oxygenated setting? It's the same in the cancer field, actually. Um, some of these clams can develop leukemia-like as, as cancer stem cells. Mm. And the focus in how focus the researchers now focus on how those stems cancer cell stems can survive inside the clams when the clams are closed because then they're basically anoxic or hypoxic. Mm. I think the opposite is the most remarkable. How can those cancer stem cells survive in the o- in the ocean where they're actually transiting over an over an oxygenated phase? Mm. And the same for circulating cancer cells that maintain cancer stemness, even though they're flushed around in a really oxygenated vascular setting. That's that's the paradox. Because when animals evolve, what's, what we keep forgetting is that animals evolved when oxygen was low, as you say, eons back. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about half a billion years ago. And even though in the sort of Earth history field, we fight a lot of how high, you know, if someone actually finds this increase of oxygen in the Cambrian that everyone's looking for. I was also looking for that during my PhD and postdoc. You know, there has to be evidence for increased oxygen around the Cambrian. We don't see it. It's basically a fat, flat line, but everyone's still looking for it. But even if we're fighting of who has that, sort of smoking gun, the evidence of that smoking gun, we all agree it was way, way lower lower then than it is today. Mm-hmm. So we, our estimates can't say exactly, but we can sort of bracket the concentrations and they, they seem to be have been at most 5%, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit higher, maybe a wow. little lower. So what we consider today as hypoxic was really normal then. And then if you mm-hmm. flip the perspective, you can actually see that ad- adaptations, you know, that, that hypoxia was normal and some cellular adaptations actually were, you know, we're all for coping with higher oxygen and maintaining stem cells at the same time. Wow. So since you brought it up a few times and it's been up, you know, we brought it up a few times on the show so far, this topic of the Cambrian explosion, right? Not everybody might know what that's about since this is the stem cell podcast. It's a stem cell show. But today I get the chance to talk about fossils, dinosaurs and the Cambrian explosion, right? These are actually topics that I grew up reading in my favorite books about life life in the past. So I'm super excited that you're here. And indeed, kind of like Just what happens with stem cells, multicellular life on the whole has undergone these cycles of growth and decline, like what we're talking about here today, perhaps most vividly marked by events such as the Cambrian explosion of life, where there's just a large, huge number of multicellular life forms that emerged, not overnight, but a very short period of time in the grand scale of the eons of life, right? And on the other hand, there's these catastrophic extinction events, like what actually happened happened at the end of the dinosaurs, the end of the age of the dinosaurs, or maybe what happened right before the dinosaurs emerged as well, right? Do you think stem cells had some role in determining what species might survive through, say, an extinction event like that? Or in other words, do you think that enhanced adult stem cell renewal and function might shield some species from these massive environmental changes that we're talking about, like uh, in some of these extinction events, for example? I think that those are really good questions. And I do think for sure that stem cell capacity, 
that differs between animals, and I would say they differ the most between invertebrates and vertebrates, that has defined how those big animal groups have have evolved over time you know if i if i i suggest for example that invertebrates have a lower capacity for stem cell maintenance at at oxic conditions and they were i mean they've been dominant all along but invertebrate animals like mollusks and arthropods they 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 were really hard hit when oxygen finally increased to modern levels so you can you can you can think of Low, that Earth was a low oxygen environment for almost 100 million years after the Cambrian explosion, and the invertebrates were just happy, and you know, have this, you have these huge ammonites in the in the in the oceans, and you have all kinds of trilobites, fun ones that we can see at museums today. But eventually, oxygen increased to 21 percent, and I would predict that invertebrates that did not have a you know a way to maintain their stem their hypoxia and their stem cells inside were hardly hit. So that's one of the projects that we're looking into. Could, can we see that the that the survivors were the ones that could have internal hypoxia or phases of hypoxia and therefore survive in a, in a more and more oxygenated environment? That's an interesting idea. There's so many of these ideas where you have to think in a really different way uh, when you're think, thinking about evolution, you know, and you don't, you don't have the evidence in front of you. It's such a tough thing as a scientist. I really admire it. But I have to say, I have to confess, um, <laughs> as you might have gathered up to this point, that when I was looking in your rec- before I looked into your, your work, I had a really poor appreciation of the value of the fossil record to modern biology because, you know, I bet like a lot of science, I was so fixated on like, what's the the ground truth right now? You know, what's the, the yeah. reality that I can see that I didn't really care to pay attention, I guess, to the evolutionary milestones leading up to this point. I'm sure I'm not the first scientist that you've talked to that was, you know, pretty siloed up in their own interest or fascination. So just, this is kind of a uh, a general question to you as a scientist. I mean, it must be frustrating, challenging at times. How do you convey your work, your interests, your fascination to people like me in a way like you're doing right now? How, how do you do it so that we get it, so that it fits all together and we can say, oh, yeah, that's that's why now I'm interested in, in the evolutionary history and this relationship to stem cells. How do you do it? Well, it's taken me some time to see where the sort of curtain falls down of the different audiences. I know, for example, when I talk to geologists, I see that they 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 just zoom out as soon as I mention <laughs> stem cells. They think that has nothing to do with them. So now I've known that this is one of those so-called concept thresholds. I have to stay for a bit. I have to call it out. I have to say, okay, you, you might think this has nothing to do with you, but I'm going to give you a 101 on stem cells and it's just going to take five minutes, then I can sort of uh, keep their attention for those five minutes and actually show that they have, you know, as many cells in the body as there are stars in the galaxy and that they exchange as many cells in a year and those, that exchange is thanks to stem cells. If mm-hmm. I manage, you know, to capture them for those few uh, seconds when they think they shouldn't listen, I can, I can, you know, maintain their interest that it actually matters to them. And it was actually the same for me. You say you don't know that much about evolution, but I had no idea about stem cells like five years ago. I had no idea I didn't it even, even had them, you know, that I exchanged all of this sort of epithelial lining in the intestine, you know, 2000 two times, I didn't think it mattered, you know, <laughs> so, so, so I didn't know either. And when it comes to, to the stem cell audience, I think one, I have, I have a few of those hooks to, that I know matters. And one of them is, for example, to show that low oxygen has been the normal ancestral state on earth for mm. most of Earth's history. Mm-hmm. And that we actually, you know, sit up here at twenty one percent and think that's normal. We think it's normal to be big. We think it's easy to be big. And then I show a couple of arguments saying that it seems actually quite hard to be big. It happens, you know, big life diversifies really late in Earth history. We really few us who are big, and that we also have this paradox with stem cell, the being built by stem cells who say don't like oxygen, mm-hmm. but we need them to live in oxy conditions. It mm-hmm. doesn't just doesn't really add up yet. And then I think I can 
I can catch a few more from sort of your field to see <laughs> that there are things we don't understand about. And thanks to actually looking into the past. Yeah, it's a tremendous skill that you have, and it's not an easy one to develop, this ability to transition from you know, geology to stem cell biology back and forth and be an expert in multiple fields. And to say that you've only developed this expertise in the last five years or so, that's incredible. So congratulations to you. I mean, this is a testament to your ability as a science communicator. And I think that's something that we really stress here on the show is, you know, how do you best convey science to multiple audiences? And I think I think you've got it figured out, Dr. Hammerlund. So congrats. And oh. you've actually got perhaps the most unique research expertise of anyone we've had on the show for a really long time. And this conversation has just been so fascinating. You're a paleobiologist, right? You're somebody who actually studies the molecular biology of life living millions of years ago and how it's evolved and contributed to shaping the descendants here today, like all of us here, right? And so we've got to talk a little bit more about your training since our listeners are in large part trainees and may not have an understanding of how you actually got to this point. So is a paleobiologist always something that you wanted to be or is your passion for paleobiology and geology something that evolved, quote unquote, over time during your training? And if somebody wanted to actually follow in your footsteps and be a stem cell slash tumor paleobiologist like yourself, what sort of training would you recommend for them? I'm sure it's been a tremendous journey for you. It is a it is a still a tremendous journey, a really fun one. And I, I think my advice would be to really, f you know, follow where you have the butterflies in the in the tummy, because that's, you know, my my uncle said you can't read biology and geology because you need to, you know, study e economics. That's where the jobs are. And I knew I would never study economics, so I just, you know, took a chance. And I think it that's. That's how I've kept on going. I, I'm thankful that you say I have a, tr you know, a unique uh, combination of, you know, a skill to, to discuss, you know, this to discuss between between different fields. But I don't think I'm an expert in. I'm not really an expert in stem cell or tumor biology yet, for sure. But I, I, I think I dare to be the rookie rather than being an expert. I dare to, to. I'm okay with not being an expert. And I think that allows me to venture into different discussions. I'm not really afraid of not seeming to be the uh, the smartest person in the room. Hmm. And I maybe it actually, I have actually benefited from being a woman and short. People have always thought of me as a kid. They put, you know, <laughs> they, lead, they put their head on the side and try to explain things to me in a very naive way. And that means I can actually... I can actually, you know, be camouflaged into different settings, not knowing everything. So I think that would be um, why I have ventured into the different fields. But, but I think also I've, I've been, I, I'm, 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 I'm driven by, I'm, I'm driven by, I've always been driven to, by this question of how everything connects, you know, everything like from the continents moving over the earth's surface and, and, uh, how we live on them, where we come from, which is an interest all people think about now and then, you know, where we come from, where we're heading, what's the point of everything. So mm -hmm. so I, I just took it a bit far to try and understand both the evolution of animals and now cancer, but it's it all it's all connected to our origins basically. And and geology is one way, one place to start, of course, to understand where, where animals come from. But I've noticed that it's not enough. You know, we can't ever resolve cause from effect when we look at the rock record we can even if we look at the best you know rock core of old sediments with fossils and chemistry we can't say what led to what mm -hmm. we need to go back into the lab and that's where biology development of biology tumor biology is perfect and i've noticed that uh you're welcome in most places even though you you know if you if you come with another training or another bag baggage if you if you sort of join around a question, it doesn't matter if you're tall or short or geologist or stem cell. You, you just you know, sort of unite around a question. And that's the beauty with science, I think. Everything else gets secondary. Hmm. And I've been lucky also to get in touch with mentors that have taken the time to hear me out. Because a professor in tumor biology ha would have every right to say he doesn't have time to talk to me. But when I contacted 
one of them, he said, yeah, sure. I don't know what I can give you, but let's sit down and chat, you know, and compare notes. And to him, it was an eye opener to hear that animals evolved at low oxygen. And to me, it was an eye opener to hear that stem, we have stem cells and they are maintained at low oxygen, at least some of them. So I... It's a, it's a fair exchange, I guess. But I think you're a bit modest. You talk about your lack of expertise. But I, I, listening to you, what I realize is no one really has expertise. You know, you're not born with it. You have an interest and you have our fascination, whatever you want to call it. And that becomes expertise, right? Because you just you, you're never satisfied um, yeah. with the answers that are there. You're always looking for the truth. And that is, I think, a measure of courage, right? You know, your expertise stems from your courage and your, 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 you're a bit of a adventurous spirit, I would say. And that brings me to my next question. I wonder if that is like, uh, uh, an element, <laughs> uh, of geology and, and, and your, scientific training history just because it's what you see on tv you know you, you talk about science and what you see on tv geoscience it's all about like the dig site archaeologists you know geologists they're like lara croft or indiana jones you know and, and yeah. the people in the lab are you know poindexter with our beakers and our bow ties and we're all a bunch of geeks you got science in the Jamaling formation, you got science in the early Cambrian succession in Chengjian. I mean, that <laughs> sounds badass. I can't even <laughs> say the names. Um, is there anything to this notion of like the adventurer scientists in your own personal history? I mean, you're on the dig sites. Is it like boring quotidian and it's all in the imagination of the fiction writers or is there a reality to being out there on the dig site? Does it feel like you're like, Oh yes. Oh yeah. It's super macho, super fun. And it's, you know, it's dirty and it's, you have these sledgehammers and chisels and you need glasses to not get blind and it's sunshine and you're sort of like frying you. So, and you get like one of the best field trips I've had was up at the Northern tip of Greenland. You can basically look out, to the end of the world and we were wow. there for three weeks and it gets really dirty and the kitchen looks like a mess and it's just a, you know a shower after those three weeks is like heaven of <laughs> course you you know you're alive you know you're it's beautiful to be a human person you know to be human when you've been three weeks and you have rock dust into your ear bones mm. so so yes it's it's absolutely fantastic and then you get home with uh with a harvest that's so precious, mm. you know, it's actually rocks opening up with, with life in them, you know, evidence of a trilobite or, or a worm that nobody ever knew existed. And, you know, you, you give it some, you give it some, uh, some, uh, some, it's, it's, you give it some honor, no, it's not honor is not the word, you give it some you give it attention again, right? It's it's there again. You see it, and you, yeah. you try to decipher what kind of environment it was living in. It's a it's an honor in a sense. It's a privilege to hmm. to be able to touch and see and study what was going on hmm. half a billion years ago. And even I worked on one of the big extinctions, and it's funny because ninety percent of all animal species died then. And we studied with joy. It's so weird, you know. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody is sad that ninety-five percent of all species died because it's so so long ago. And we just find it fascinating. So it's a, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre take on our history and our past, which is mainly joyful. And I can I can say that I don't, you know, look into much of the climate change today because that's affecting us. That's expect, you know, that affects how we think about our kids and stuff. So I think. Science in that sense gives a bubble of relief because it's in the past. It's just it's like a big piece, of, a, a puzzle, you know, that we need to piece together. Hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And with other methods like tumor biology and stem cell science, we can hopefully make a better job. But it's still just fun. Hmm. So fun. And, you know, the passion that you have for multiple fields is so apparent and so obvious just by listening to you from this interview. And it's um, hopefully a source of inspiration for the, the trainees in our audience here. You know, you can be anything you want to be. You can start off as a geologist. You can transition into a stem cell biologist, a cancer biologist. Science is the goal. And as long as you see that science is a fun thing to do, then just follow your passions. And I think that's what you've done here. And thank you so much 
for sharing your journey with us, Dr. Hammerlund. And before we actually let you go, we're going to ask you a couple of science peripheral questions. I'll ask the first one, then maybe Dalon can ask the last two. So if you could answer any single scientific question, regardless of your expertise or chosen field, what would it be? Then I think I would like to answer whether or not there is some kind of quorum sensing system to consciousness, mm. you know, to this sort of different levels of uh, computational power that we know has followed with evolution. We know that bacteria has less of a computational power together than a worm has. And we know that we have more of computational power than a worm. And we, But we don't really know how that connects to consciousness. We know that we are conscious. We don't think that worms are very conscious. But, But, you know, there must be some kind of connection between between these levels of computational power that life has passed through and consciousness and now with the societies and internet and you know we're at a higher level of computational power mm. than us on our own mm. and i wonder you know where it stops where, where are the different levels of 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 computational power versus consciousness you know is there yeah. some kind of quorum sensing idea behind that so that was a that, that that's something that would be fun to answer if i could you really are fearless even in your imaginary <laughs> questions you go far out i mean i'm always a bit agog at the people that take on neurobiology just i think it's too meta but you're talking about consciousness wow this is some bravery <laughs> uh i would have been surprised if i hadn't talked to you for the last half hour and, and gotten to know you a little bit but um that is still very cool next question what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, either professional or not? The best piece of advice is actually like a reversed advice. And that was my I, mom that in so many words when I was a kid said that growing up and going to work is not going to be all that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I have. I'm convinced I have one of the best jobs on the planet. And it's not always fun, of course. We all know what admin tasks can do to your patients and to, right. your, to your day. But generally, I, I really en enjoy, you know, work. So that, that, that's, I, and I remember when she said that, I know that's uh, directed me. To, to do the fun stuff since then. So so even though it's a reverse kind of advice, it did matter that she thought it wouldn't be fun. Wrong advice sometimes. <laughs> Our reverse psychology you could consider. It. Maybe she had the uh, ticket the whole time, knew you were going to be a famous scientist one day. My own mother, I have to say here at one point, the best piece of advice she ever gave me was similar. Uh -huh. And it was formative for my career because right out of college, I was all set to go to graduate school and I was like, you know what, mom, I think I could be an actor. And my mother, who would support anything, I could say I want to be an astronaut. I could say literally anything. I want to be a murderer. And she'd probably be that <laughs> supportive. In this case, she said, no, you're not going to be an actor. You're going to go to grad school. And thank you, mom, for that. Moving on yeah. to the last question. What is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to resolve? I, I'm not sure if it's a misconception, but I... Uh, I uh, interpret it as a misconception today and that is that being a specialist has more worth than being a generalist mm -hmm. i really think we need the bo both of course and i one thing that proves that's the case now is that it's extremely hard to publish hypothesis for example mm -hmm. you know this generalist's idea this this general idea of of how things fit together, those are extremely different, difficult to publish. And I think that, com that, that, that stems from us thinking about, you know, digging in the same place, which is valuable, being a specialist, knowing the nitty gritty of a certain question, which is completely, you know, fascinating and, and necessary, but it has to come with a generalist sort of model also and perspective of where it fits in. Mm. We're drowning in data from from different wells of science. And I really think we need to be better at tying them together in, in bigger picture right. pictures too. Right. One of the one of my favorite things that I don't know who said it, but they were talking about a scientist and they said in, in speaking about why 
he, this particular scientist, was so great. And they said, you know why he's such a great scientist? Because he can see the whole organism. And uh, I think that applies in all fields, too, even astrophysics. See, you know, you can see yeah. the whole, like a unified theory. It's that idea. Um, and yeah. I think you're that person. You, you're, you're at least looking at the big picture and you're getting glimpses of the whole organism. I admire that about you. Uh, and your uh, your science and your work, and uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Arun, myself, and the listeners for joining us today and sharing with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. What a fun chat we had with Dr. Emma Hammerlin. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. You know, it's fun to have someone who has a specialty outside of stem cells on the show because they really open up our minds to insights that we probably wouldn't have even considered. So if you're out there and you don't think you're a stem cell biologist, but you might be related at all, give us an email. Until the next episode in a couple weeks, thanks for listening, guys. Mm-hmm.